All right, welcome back to Not Another Buffalo Podcast. I'm John. I'm here with my buddies. This is not a Buffalo Rumblings podcast. I'm not used to doing this intro and not saying we're a Buffalo Rumblings podcast, so it's going to take me a couple episodes to get used to that. <laughs> uh, this episode is brought to you by Small City Realty. If you're looking to buy, sell, or manage property in Western New York, you got to call Zach Corzillis at Small City Realty. His number is 585-409-1088. 585-409-1088. And you can always find that number in the show notes if you forget it. Gentlemen, I feel like this is one of the most busy draft leadups that we've had in the past couple of years just because of the sheer number of other things going on at this time. Like I'm looking at clips of last year and it's so funny, actually, I didn't need to start here, but I, I'm looking at the high, the first couple highlight clips that we put on Instagram were just about a year ago in the off season. And it's Brando and I talking about Diggs being cryptic and Benjamin Albright coming out with a news story that says the Bills might consider trading Diggs. <laughs> And we all thought that that was just clickbait. And maybe it was like it probably was at that point still. But now that we're, you know, hindsight is 2020, it's really easy to buy into all that stuff and be like, OK, maybe there was a little bit of credence to that at the time. Maybe there was a reason for those rumors, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. So maybe there was some stuff going back. But anyway, it's really funny to see that because that was mainly what we were talking about last year at this time. And now this year, I mean, it's just like pile the events on top of each other we have like our network was dissolved oj the trade of stefan diggs what else happened? we could have the red helmets that happened today because the buffalo bills are eligible this year to do the red helmets it's not Time that they sweet. chose not to last year i guess it was because they weren't going through a formal uniform change that they weren't eligible to do a third helmet last year but the nfl has extended it to all clubs to you're, have you're only allowed to yeah helmets. to have three yes. helmets so we could see that Buffalo Bills red, but would you guys be excited about that? I feel like in today's day and age. Yeah, I use that helmet every time I play on that. Yeah. Anything to get excited about, I will get excited about within reason. That's true. I mean, what 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 got yeah. us through the drought? Like cool throwback uniforms? We're like, oh yeah, all right. EJ Manuel's wearing yeah. a red I buffalo on his head. Get, get I hyped. I, I did not like those those AFL jerseys at all. I mean, I just was not. That, that is a that is a minority opinion, I feel like, because most people like them. I didn't hate them, but I wasn't like, this is the best Buffalo U Bills uniform of them all. I still think that their best looking uniform right now is the Stormtroopers, white on white with the white helmets. It's just so clean. Like, you can't beat that. And some of their best games have come in those uniforms, yeah. obviously. I still think if you went blue on blue with the red helmet. Like, really? That. that might be a little too much color for me. I, I think white on white with the red helmet too would be blue, too probably my favorite. I don't know. Or the or blue top, white bottoms yeah. with a red helmet. Yeah. Might be the kind of the classic look here. that they go to. Yeah. But yeah, whatever they do, they just have to make that 90s. I feel like the key to it is not making the helmet look too modern, but maybe not 100% like the original. You know what I'm saying? Because like the 90s red, and again, it has to be the 90s red helmet because the triple stripe thing that they did in the 2000s was a little bit too much where they had like a navy blue stripe and then like two white stripes on either side of it. It was just a little bit more complicated. So I, I feel like if they go very 90s blue and red bills focused, I'll be happy with it. So we have two weeks to go until the draft. I feel like we might need to get our, our draft prep together here, maybe before next week and, and do some stuff. But I haven't really moved off of my theory that trading up to get someone like Brian Thomas Jr. might not be a bad move. Brian, I just put out that clip today about your idea to trade it for Brian Thomas Jr. and use the next year's first round pick like that on fire to go, uh, you know, get Brandon Ayuk here. Which, when I say light it on fire, I mean, it could be worth it. It could be worth it. Yeah, I swear FanDuel saw our episode, and then they put out that tweet with Brian Thomas Jr., Brandon Ayuk, and the Buffalo Bills. I, I'd never seen that idea before. I think that's awesome. Like, go do it. Just go do it. I don't know why you wouldn't. Right. It's just cap space. <laughs> it's just cap it's just space. A draft pick, you know, it's just, you got Josh Allen. Come on. It's just cap space and draft picks. What else are you going to use them for? So I like that attitude. I, I feel like sometimes Bills fans and... We as Bills fans, when we talk, I mean, we're guilty of this. We pretend like cap money is our own money. Like, I wouldn't spend that on that guy. Or like, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use two draft picks to trade to get that guy. Like that's the, you know, and again, we're just doing value equations based on what we think the team should do. But when it comes to all the cap gymnastics that you can do, Really, who pays extra is Terry Pagula because there are cap maneuvers that you can do where you pay money up front to move money further down the line. 
And there are people who can explain this a lot better than I can, but teams that are cash poor can't make as many moves as teams that are not cash poor, even though everyone lives under the same cap, if that makes sense. So it's not quite totally as unequal as baseball, where some teams' entire payroll is quite a bit less than other teams. Everyone's got the same salary cap. It's interesting. I don't think there's any team in the NFL that's cash poor, just based on the TV deals that you get. You're getting, before you even play a game, a $270 million check. Let me be specific. When I say cash, it's like it's it's the liquidity of the money where you can spend it. Like in in a business sense, cash is like in a certain time frame. Like your your expendable amount of money. Like it's not necessarily indicative of the the revenue that you would have as a team. It's more so like the the money that you would have allocated at a certain time and a certain budget to be able to spend it. Like outside of the salary cap. Pat's absolutely right. And the other thing about these. These owners that have millions and millions and millions, you know, a guy like Terry Pagula is not an owner who's cash poor. Not that any of these owner groups are, but if you think about these owner groups, right? And I'm, I don't know if this is, you know, Terry Pagula can write a check pretty quick because he owns the team, right? Owner groups. I mean, I wonder what the liquidity situation is in Green Bay with their their shareholder team, right? But Pat Pat's absolutely absolutely right. It's the amount of cash available at any time and you know if we're wrong about that somebody correct us because again you know we're oh, we're under michael, michael hattery this, suny brockport masters of public administration program you're the man teaching us <laughs> real life lessons but what we're saying is you get a check for 260 million dollars to start the year the world between baseball and football is amazingly different right it's two pro sports leagues being you know you have america's game that is supposedly you know forever was the greatest and now you have this cash cow in the nfl and to see a team like Oakland just flounder, and even in the NHL, you know they say the original six teams bring in all the money for all the other twenty-five teams in the league. It's crazy that the NFL can just print, 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 print money. I mean, Terry Pagula, the net worth for the Bills has gone up drastically since he bought them, and even for the Sabers. But these other teams in pro sports struggling to be able to sign guys is—it's crazy to me that in America this time of our society that these teams are cash poor. Well, it really has to do with an owner's willingness to front money in short-term situations, right? So a lot of times this money sits in escrow for yeah. things. So you're right. You have tons of revenue, but it's like that money's not just sitting in a bank account ready to go out the door. That's what Pat's talking about with liquidity. So sometimes you need an owner to write a fast check like, hey, we're moving Stefan Diggs bonus money up to this year. We need to write a check this week. See, certain teams can't do that or are not willing to do that yeah. or for other reasons. I'd assume Green Bay has some kind of complications with that or they have something set up. Like I, I don't claim to understand any of it, but there there is something to be said for quote unquote cash poor teams. And it's all relative. They're not actually cash poor, but relative to other teams, certain owners are willing to write a check on, you know, short term notice and then, you know, front the cash for for some kind of these deals just to just to execute certain cap gymnastics, basically. So I'm just doing a little research here on Green Bay and it says uh, Green Bay brings in six hundred and ten million dollars in revenue for twenty twenty two. But the Packers reported a sixty nine million dollar operating profit based on when they include their salary cap, their roster bonuses, their operating expenses and everything like that. But they say all of the money is invested right back into the organization because the shareholders can't sell or cash in their shares. Unlike other teams, all of the Packers profits go back into their organization. So that's kind of interesting. What did you guys think about? Did you hear Tom Brady at all talking about uh, potential comeback plans? Yeah, I did hear that. So I don't remember what pod what podcast he was on. He said, he said, Josh Allen was going to be the next, he, he thinks is the next quarterback who doesn't have a Super Bowl to win one. Right. That was the quote you're talking about. Yep. Earlier in the week too, he talked about uh, coming back without saying he, he did say that like if a team like the 40, I mean, he is from San Francisco, but I mean, what are the chances that he plays so, next year? Less than 1%. So Brady said it on an episode of Deep Cups with Vic Blends. He was getting a haircut, and they asked him if a team called to play if their quarterback got hurt, would he do it? And he was like, I'm not opposed to it. I don't know if they're going to let me if I become an owner of an NFL team. I don't know. I'm always going to be in good shape, and I'm always going to be able to throw the ball. 
to come in for a little bit, like MJ coming back. I don't know if they would let me, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. I don't know. I kind of hope he comes back and falls on his face. Like, I don't want to wish ill will towards anybody, but I mean, come on, it's Brady, yeah. right? I mean, it would be legendary to see him. Except Brady, we can wish ill will towards Brady. It would yeah. be legendary <laughs> to see him come back in a Raiders uniform and get absolutely rocked. Right. But- Oh my God. Can you imagine? Like, I, I want a side by side press conference of him and not Al Davis. Help me out. Mark Davis. Yeah. Mark Davis. Thank you. Maybe they can get haircuts together. He was on a haircutting podcast right now. Like, give me the, the Tom Brady and Mark Davis haircutting podcast weekly. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like when Tom got to that stage of his career, we laughed when he said he wanted to play till 45 and he was, what, 39 or 40 at that point. And so he had to kind of have that FU attitude in the first place to be able to make it that far. And that's not just something that goes away after you stop playing. You're always going to believe that you can still do it. That's why we get these stories about T.O. saying like, oh, I'm ready to go. Like, let's, you know, I'm 48 and a half years old. But yeah, let's, you know, f- it. We can get into the CFL, take a couple snaps. Somebody will sign yeah. me on a practice I mean, squad James and I'll Harrison be able to help somebody out late in the year. Yeah, James Harrison too. too. Yeah. Yeah. And James Harrison, to his credit, actually did play another year with somebody right was it after the Steelers who did he play for I don't remember where he finished up maybe it was just he played with the Pats towards the tail end of his career as well okay maybe that's Um, what I'm thinking of yeah that was so you don't see it you don't see it it's not likely I don't think so I might take plus 2,000 odds on that on DraftKings Brando let's say let's let's say okay NFC North's already locked up week 17 Jared Goff goes down maybe okay no no let's let's Week nine, Lions are seven and two going into a bye. Jared Goff destroys himself in practice. Yeah. yeah. Sign him. him. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Really? Like you could bring <laughs> yourself to absolutely. You could NFC, bring yourself to root for Tom Brady in that scenario. Only on the line. Not on the Bills. <laughs> only I mean, on I don't think line. he has the skill set to make our roster work, really. No. Listen, anything the Lions can do, they're not gonna win anyways. They're Detroit, right? <laughs> they're gonna drop another fourth down pass. They're gonna have a a bad play on defense where they get burned and Brady Brady won't win, but anything that they do doesn't matter because they're cursed. But like, make it interesting, right? Make us watch. Plus, if we could beat Brady and and the Lions in the Super Bowl, like I just want to have an opportunity for the Bills to beat him. All right, like I just I want another opportunity for Josh. Yeah, I feel that. I feel like there's always been a little bit of non closure there. Which I just thought that that was kind of our destiny as Bills fans to have non-closure there because even more so than the Tampa Bay game that yeah. ended very frustratingly, yeah. you know, with that second half, that, that overtime game and questionable calls there. There was two games, you know, Josh's rookie year or maybe it was Josh's second year was second Brady's year, last yeah. year as a Patriot. And man, I thought that they had him like both games. John Brown had some big games against the Patriots those years. I just really wanted to see him beat him while he was in New England. And, you know, that last year in New England where Brady had no receiving help was probably your best shot and you still couldn't get it done two times that year. So that that one stung a little bit, but everything stings. The Sabres stink. They're going to stink forever. Sabres updates need to come back because it makes sense again. We had to stop them for a second because the Sabres were getting good there for a second and boy, were we wrong. How you guys feel about Donnie Meatballs? This is something that I go back and forth on. Where do you guys stand on Donnie Meatballs? Well, John, answer this question first. So I saw this on Twitter. Jeremy and Joe were talking about it and they said, what is worse? The 13 seconds collapse against Kansas City or the 13 seasons of missing the playoffs as a Sabres fan? And I think it's 13 seconds. It's absolutely. You're right there, right? You're right there. You play the greatest game of all time. I can live with 13 years of mediocrity. No goal in 99 is the closest thing to 13 seconds. I can live with 13 seasons of mediocrity. I've done it for 17 seasons before. So we got four more before we even tap into where we were at before. So yeah, no, by far 13 yeah. seconds. I mean, put it, put it this way. If you want to debate which one is worse. Okay. So imagine that the Sabres missed the playoffs for four more years. Then they get the second coming of Dominic Hasek and they're really, really good. And they make it to the Stanley cup semifinals and they're playing against the hurricanes again. Let's just say the hurricanes. And then somebody scores with their foot in the crease and then ah. the goal counts, right? That's still not as bad as 13 that's seconds. the level that you'd have to get to, <laughs> to even compare it to 13 seconds for me. I don't know. I, what, I, what I do you don't think, know. I, the I, only comparison Pat, me, with the Sabres opinion, is the Brett Hall goal in I mean, 99. You, you got to think of it though this way. And like, this is me being an eternal optimist. I mean, I don't think they'll ever, that's probably the best Bills team we'll ever see. 
If Emmanuel no, Sanders is no. your number three, oh, if, Pat, if Emmanuel Sanders is your number three, I don't know, Brando. We were at the snow game. We were at the we were at the pass game. That's probably the. Uh, what I'm saying is, we'll win it with the worst team. Don't get me wrong, dude. We'll we'll, we'll have a burger of a roster and win one. Like I I have no doubt it'll happen. But it's just like you know, it, there's something to be said about like. You don't want to watch, you're watching these games late in the season and it's like, you're like, oh, why am I watching this? But it's like, even if you sneak in as a wild card team or, you know, I mean, we, we don't really know. We won the division a couple times in a row here, so it's hard to think like that. But like, you just, you you have that pipe dream, you know, for people. You have that, that pipe dream, even if you, I mean, obviously I don't want to say, like, I, I'm not, I'm not comparing Josh Allen to Andy Dalton in the slightest, in the slightest, in the slightest, but like, there's something to be said about even Andy Dalton making the playoffs. What was it? Five, six times in a row losing every single time. But like, I think that, it was seven. The, I think it was seven, seven times. Pat. Yeah. I think you know, it was but seven. Like, at the end of week 16 or week 17, you're just sitting there and there's no bigger endorphin rush than like, holy shit, I'm in the dance. We might, you know, you know, like, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just a dad talking out closet, but chance. like, you know, like, I'm just saying, I, I don't know. <laughs> No, I'm just saying you're telling me there's a chance, right? right. There's a, there's a way of it. There's a way to do it. I don't know. I, I it's sad. I hope we we see better teams. And it's so funny we talk about Emmanuel Sanders like that. Like in my brain, he didn't do anything special. I don't think he did anything special. But everybody, anybody that talks about Emmanuel Sanders, maybe I'm just blacking you are, it out of my head completely. Because I mean, if you look at his stats, Banks, they're really you know? good. As are Beasley's. Yeah. He had 42 catches, 626 yards, and four touchdowns, and then three catches, 52 yards, and a touchdown in two playoff games. So 600 yards, eh, eh. I don't know. I, I guess maybe I was hyping him up a little bit there. I, I don't know why I was thinking he had 900 receiving yards. It must have been Cole Beasley the previous year that had 900, but, I mean, Cole Beasley, Gabe Davis, Stefan Diggs, Emmanuel Sanders, like, pretty deep. All right, so col- color me this. Your top four wide receivers are number one, Brandon Ayuk. Number two, Brian Thomas Jr. Number three, Khalil Shakir. Number four, Curtis Samuel. Is that a better starting four than what we had before? Comparable. Comparable, possibly better. Yes. I mean, there's more upside I think, to it. I think it's got, yes. I think it's got to be better, especially because the wild card there is Curtis Samuel. I think... It's and better. again, like I don't want it. I don't want to get hype about these free agents that we signed because I sit here every time and I'm like, you know, Brando and I got hyped about Matt Breida a couple of years ago, and yeah. that turned out to be nothing. And we got know. hyped about Jamison Crowder, and he was going to be a great addition, and he looked so good, and then destroyed himself like second game of the season. So, right, and guess know. who were we excited about this year? Deontay Hardy and Trent Sherfield, and. They you paid know, they off their, though. They, 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 yeah, they had their moments, but come on, they didn't live up to the hype for you know ninety percent of it. There's a reason why neither of those guys are going to be on the team this year, right? So they did pay off in that one game, I guess. But can you can you re can you reprop that four player lineup you just said again? All right, starting four, and again, I actually think like realistically, we got to think first or second round wide receiver, which is asking a lot to have that receiver be your best receiver. So I don't know. Saying it like that, I don't know if they're going to ask a guy to go out there and be their number one wide receiver as a rookie. That's that's crazy to me. But let's say free agent wide receiver and first or second round wide receiver are your top two. Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel round out your top four, and then Mac Hollins is probably your five. And that's not even counting. Yeah, shorter. Guys he's a the, wild card. Yeah, shorter is also a, a wild card in there. Justin Shorter in the pipeline as well. So I think that would be, it's tough though. Cause you're talking about digs in his prime, right? We're not talking about digs of last year. We're talking about digs when he led the uh, NFL in receptions and receiving yards. Brandon Ayuk, I think is like a carbon copy of that though. Would you go on the record as saying that if the Buffalo bills sign Brandon Ayuk and draft a wide receiver in the first two rounds of the draft, that the wide receiver court will be better than it was last year. It's not as resounding of a yes as it was three it minutes ago. Brian Thomas Jr. But I think it's I think it's a yes. I think these I think these young guys are are going to be so explosive. Brian Thomas Jr., Xavier Louette. Oh, I'm sorry, I said his name wrong. Um, McKinney and Xavier Worthy. He ran a four two one forty. So you know, there's certain guys if you put them in there, I think that you could say yes. But if you're gonna go deeper down into the second or third round, then I say no. You get a top tier rookie, one of the guys high up on the board. Yeah, I still think there's a potential. They're thinking rebuilding year inwardly, 
and outwardly not saying that, right? Because they wouldn't say that. In their most classic rebuilding year, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean were like, no, we're all in. We want to win this year. When they're trading away Sammy Watkins, they're trading away Ronald Darby. They're getting bad contracts off. I mean, still made the playoffs though. Exactly. So it's not quite an under promise over deliver thing because they were still promising that, Hey, we're still trying to compete this season, but that's what I kind of would love the narrative of this season to be. Even if this is just me being a wishful thinker is if it's going to be a retooling year, I mean, look at what everyone thought that the Kansas City Chiefs were going through a retooling year this year with all these defensive rookies and all the young guys. And look what they made out of it the last two years. These were these could have been retooling years. And, you know, they over delivered with the roster that they had. So you get a lot. of This is going to be the youngest the Bills roster has been in the last, you know, five years, at least the least veterans in the room. And so maybe we get some exciting rookies. Like I'm excited for the explosiveness. You're going to get rookie mistakes. You're going to get errors. You're going to get guys with the wrong assignments, but you're also going to get those young legs and that explosiveness. And hopefully we get that in the wide receiver room. And all that to say, I think that there's a good possibility that, you know, you're not just looking at a first round wide receiver. I think the two wide receivers in the top three, four rounds is, is still a, a valid possibility, but you could also be Sean McDermott who says we ran the ball 70% of the time, barely threw the ball to digs, utilized Khalil Shakir and Dalton Kincaid doubled down on James Cook. And they won seven games, including a playoff game and these division games down the stretch. So why do we even need to invest in a wide receiver? Why can't we just double up on the O line? Maybe, Maybe draft a guy Collins. later. Take, they just had the guy, the number one rated running back, come in for a visit. Also, what is his name? Benson, Trey Benson. So you never know what McDermott's thinking over there with his defensive hard hat. That's on, so. that's true. I would be, you'd be crushed. Color, color me super surprised if that's anything that was going through McDermott's mind. I I, I think McDermott is defensive minded, but he's not. Me too. He's, he's not I agree. stupid. He's not. And again, 70% run is a huge exaggeration. I mean, we're still looking at like 48% run rate or something like that when it was at its peak, I think, during some of those Joe Brady games. No, 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 no. And the well, last. You're, you're talking about that. You're talking in about the last the, part of the season. They were pushing 66, 67. You're talking about that game where they just kept running it on Dallas, though, right? Run game. I mean, I'm sure that's an outlier, but. No, Dallas skews it a, a, a little bit, but the pass to run ratio was way different than it was for even Brian Dable. We talked about it on here. You can search it up on uh, PFF. They have it on their pass run rate per game for the last seven games. Can you pull that season. up for me? And the bills are like way skewed. I cannot pull that up for you, John. I'm sorry. Oh, your laptop's <laughs> not working. Okay. Buffalo Bills pass rate 2023, and then you can filter it by game. And you can see like last five. Do you mean uh, or PFF or what's the other one? Uh, that PFR. Should be like? but PFR. If, thank you. PFR is a dangerous rabbit hole for me because then I want to know who had the most receiving yards on the 1987 Green Bay Packers. And that's <laughs> it's on FF today, a fantasy football rate today. So the Bills throughout the whole season went 47% to 53%. But if you take a look at the last seven or eight games, it's really skewed. Okay, right here. Buffalo Bills. I'm wrong. You're right, Johnny. Let's see. If we go to the last three games of the season, they were at 49% pass. I don't know. You got to play with this. But either way, it was skewed compared to what it was with Dable. And it's been going down ever since. Yeah, that's true. But it's much much closer to 250 than it was before. Because it was, it used to be skewed, you know, almost 60 to 70% pass. So you do have the percentage points going the other way. But yeah. I think that everyone and their cousin in Buffalo would be very upset if they started running at a 70% clip and it wasn't working. Like that's that's the run, run, pass, punt, Dick yeah. Duran offense right there. So hopefully we don't get back to that. But again, we're talking about all these receivers. It's nothing to take away from James Cook, who I think is going to have another exciting year this year. It's just you just have to have the weapons on the outside because if teams can play you run first and you don't have a threat in the passing game, you're dead in the water in today's NFL. And I think that Sean McDermott realizes that he might be a defensive minded guy, but he has not a perfect growth mindset, as we've seen, 
because some mistakes are made twice here, but he knows that passing is the way to win in today's NFL. He's not trying to go back to the quote unquote glory days of football or anything like that. I don't think so. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for getting through it, Brando. <laughs> no, uh, those no. of those of you listening, we have been experiencing like the most technical difficulties that I think that we've ever gone through in an episode. So Brandon's on his phone. It's like delayed by five seconds. We can barely hear him. Sorry if we were rambling a little bit. We couldn't move from topic to topic as efficiently as we wanted to. But anyway, we'll be back next week. Hopefully we'll have some updates here in the weeks to come about the future of NABP. But for now, we're just, you know, we're taking it as we go. Pat will be joining us live from his closet for the foreseeable future. He's going to be on dad duty soon if you guys missed the announcement last week. And uh, Brando, hopefully we can get his computer back up and running because I can't. Brandon is like two pixels put together right now and five seconds behind. So hopefully we can get that fixed for next week and uh, hopefully his sound will be better too. But we've been getting through it the last couple of weeks. Last week we had an emergency pod and... uh, a bunch of unexpected circumstances. So and we got through that. All right. So again, thank you everybody for listening. A couple of shout outs before we get off here. If you haven't listened before, every week, Pat Moran has Anthony Marino on his show, Talking Buffalo. Talking Buffalo is always a good listen. Pat Moran's been doing it longer than anybody else. He's the OG of Buffalo podcasting. Always a great listen. I love listening to Anthony on there because of course, you know, we we know Anthony. We love Anthony. And they have some great conversations. And they had some really nice words to say about our pod last week. And uh, that was pretty cool because those are two guys that we definitely look up to in the space. And they said some pretty nice things about our pod and our chemistry. And it's cool to hear that because, you know, we always say, you know, we're just buddies meeting up each week because we got busier and busier lives and we live 700 miles away from each other. And you guys live two hours away from each other. And so it's nice to just hang out with you guys every week. But it's nice that people enjoy it. And it's not just, you know, us doing this for our own gratification and putting it out. So appreciate you guys. Also, shout out to the owners of Strike Force Lanes in Oakfield, New York, who resurrected our childhood bowling alley. We went a couple times over the past weekend while I was in town and it was a blast. That was nice to see everybody and a uh, great experience there. And that bowling alley was closed for a long time after the owner died. So really appreciate that. A small institution in our tiny little town that we grew up in, in Oakfield, New York. So if you get a chance to Yep. Drive out past Batavia, Oakfield, New York. It's uh, 49 South Pearl Street, Oakfield, New York. Strike Force Lanes. Definitely check it out. Also figured uh, since we're on the topic of it, John, did you uh, eat any good pizza while you were out there? I know uh, they're not a paid sponsor, but... Tino's is the hometown favorite. Pat, you just had the fried dough, right? You introduced the fried dough to your significant other. Yeah, we had we had slices too. You can give them a ring at 585-948-5266. I'm not being paid. It's just the best pizza you can have. Great ambiance, great great people. Brando worked there back in the day. Great employee. So (laughs) check it out for sure. Uh, I love it. All right. Well, we'll be back next week with more shout outs to our hometown establishments. And uh, until then, go Bills. Go Bills. Bills.